My name is Keith Stewart. I wear two hats in the company. Uh, one, I run our ADX business, and two, I'm responsible for our overall SDN strategy as a company. And with me as my beautiful assistant today. <laughs> hey guys, I am Martin McNeilis. I wear one hat, and that is responsibility for the VDX line, including obviously the fabric technologies that you heard about earlier today. So good to meet you, some of whom I think I know, some of whom I know online, and some of whom I've yet to meet, but uh, looking forward to getting your input here. So what we wanted to do today was try and relatively quickly drive through, I believe I have uh, a grand total of seven slides. Uh, some of you may have seen a couple of these things before, some of you may have not. What I'd like as much as you can is to take notes and hold questions. If it's burning uh, hair on fire, uh, go ahead, throw the question out. Uh, but we want to make sure that we get across all of it to get the context, and then we can go back and forth uh, and much more dialogue-y for the remainder of it. Does that make sense? Does that work? Sure. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, I'm sure others have said this, but ours perhaps more than any other. Um, we will be talking about things going <laughs> forward. Uh, the lawyers make us say this. If we choose to change our mind as a company, um, that's our right. Okay. With that out of the way, um, I wanted to start... Uh, talking about the sort of business-centric problem statements around SDN that we're hearing from people. Um, because I think we would all agree getting through the hype and the SDN washing of everything that's going on right now is brutal. And this will tie very much to the very end, which is seven different use cases that we are tracking most closely that we think there's real value in. Um, most of these you've heard before, so I'll move quick, but I want to be specific. So scale-out multi-tenancy is a combination both of the scale problem as well as driving high levels of, of multi-tenancy. So scale was really a lot of the original driver towards end cap type things, whether it's PBB or, or VXLAN or what have you, trying to overcome the, the uh, 4,000 K or 4,000 VLAN limit. Um, but getting tenant densities up, especially with the move towards 100 gig, um, and the, to try and make those economic models work is becoming more and more a problem. So that's the first one. <coughs> Second one, uh, agility, we've all heard this a thousand times. How do I take uh, the introduction of a new tenant in a hosting environment from 45 days for bring up down to 45 minutes for bring up? Um, those, by the way, are not made up numbers. Um, there is a very, very large hosting provider, one might call them the largest in the world, um, that's a very large brocade customer, and that is exactly their current problem statement. It was interesting, the SDN movement caused their uh, uh, finance folks to get more involved in understanding how real this problem was. And when we started the exercise, we asked them the question, how long does it take from the time one of your salespeople sells a network solution to one of your customers to when your operations team can turn over the keys? And they said, that takes us about 15 days. No problem. Uh, and then they went and actually looked, and it's way more like 45 days, and that's incredibly expensive. I mean, the lost revenue for that is astronomical. Um, so that's their target. <coughs> the innovation one is, is, I think, where a lot of us see the premise and promise of networking becoming much more uh, inclusive. Uh, one of the ways that I like to talk about this is the, the quote-unquote long tail of use cases. Right? The way that networking as an industry is currently structured with a set of providers, technology providers, that you can count on one, maybe two hands, is that micro use cases really struggle to get implemented in software. Right? The big macro use cases, uh, um, we don't necessarily need an open environment to get those uh, implemented, because sooner or later, one of the networking vendors is going to find the business case necessary to do that. It's the really itty bitty, teeny tiny things that are specific to one industry or one kind of problem uh, where the openness and the building out of a, an ecosystem there starts to matter. Uh, you think about uh, anywhere where sort of scripting marketplaces have taken hold, and it's really those micro use cases where things really get valuable. So I think that's that piece. And finally, um, increasingly, and I would say this is a phenomenon in the, really about the last six months that we've seen, this notion of in, uh, uh, network intelligence, network insight, analytics, as a core value proposition of SDN has really started to rise up. You know, a lot of the initial conversation was the three on the left, uh, but uh, as one large SP said to me, we've recognized that in order to build the business case to take on those things on the left, step one is to get a richer set of <coughs> analytics out of the environment 
that are needed to drive that business case. So in other words, this network insight use case, this notion of a network-wide weather map that I can use to drive policy decisions in the environment is in and of itself an, a, a destination that's needed to get to some of these other longer-term pieces. Uh, and one of the things that, that you guys will hear from Martin and I as sort of a core part of our overall uh, sense of what we need to do as a community in SDN is the need to think about not just the destination but the steps along the road. The hybrid mode stuff in MLX is all about that. Some of the use cases that you'll hear us talk about that are frankly pretty uh, micro <coughs> are all about that. We need to find uh, uh, tractable projects that people can get started so that operations teams can start to get their heads wrapped around the technology, that we can build the people and process side of things that we've had 25 years doing on the other side of the house, and effectively here we have nothing. So I think that's the core thing you're going to see us work on over the next year or two. All right, now many of you will have seen this before. Um, it is the framework with which we look at this problem statement. Um, like any good networking uh, movement, we need a layer cake. If you don't have a layer cake, you're nothing. Um, <laughs> The four layers in our mind are the evolving nature, or the, the evolving change of what's happening at the network layer. And I think there is uh, universal agreement that in particular in the data center, and I think increasingly in the, uh, in the WAN, that we need to move architecturally from a hierarchical worldview to a fabric-based worldview. Now, whether that means you want your fabric lean and mean and self-provisioned, whether you want something uh, that's got more intrinsic value within it, that's where we see that debate happening. But the notion on how you got to build this stuff out, I think, is, is, is been fought and won. On top of that, the network virtualization layer, which to me is a very different layer. The bottom layer says, I want reachability with low latency, high performance, low overhead interconnect between any arbitrary point in the environment. On top of that, I then want to be able to create those arbitrary layer two or layer three based adjacencies. And I want those to be isolated sufficiently one from another that the that entirely blowing up one of those environments has little to no effect on any of the other virtual environments. Uh, one of the core ways of solving that service agility problem is not just the sort of mythical notion of let's use software. It's the idea of limiting the domain of uh, uh, failure in the environment, which then will let me slim down my change management process. Right. We've got these big, ugly change management processes in a lot of environments precisely because of the risk profile associated with the change. If I can shrink the risk profile, I can shrink the change management profile designed to mitigate that. Third piece here, the application construct. Um, and this is where I suspect we'll have an interesting series of conversations about the relationship between controllers and applications. Fast forwarding to that question, uh, we don't believe controllers are really all that valuable. We believe the application that sits on top of the controller is where the value is. I think Kurt made an excellent point earlier on the need to drive some standardization on the northbound side of a controller. Controllers, frankly, a glorified protocol stack. That doesn't mean that it's not important, but it does mean that it's the software value add that sits on top of that, which is where we should all be putting our focus, and ensuring that we don't end up creating a lock-in environment on the controller side that mirrors the lock-in that we've had uh, on the, uh, the embedded system side. So we'll come back to that conversation. Uh, and finally, of course, cloud management. You guys heard us talk about our vision on how that comes together, handling the, the configuration policy and monitoring side of things with the same kind of programmatic control. So this is our overall view on how things come together. Um, I wanted to do uh, three quick slides that talk about three different priority projects and programs for us. One, Fabrics, two, MLX, and three, ADX. Uh, and then I'll drive to the use case slide, and that's probably where we'll park. So on the uh, fabric side, we talked about those three layers, right? Network virtualization, applications or programmatic control, and cloud orchestration. The question for us is, if I'm trying to build that bottom layer, that network fabric layer, what are the kinds of attributes that that network fabric layer needs to have? And for us, it's really three things that we come back to over and over <coughs> again. Number one, I need that infrastructure to be as efficient as possible. Part of the objective of the virtualization layer is to allow me to start stacking networks on top of one another and driving the overall efficiency up. That means I can start deferring purchases. If I can get my network link utilization up from 30% to 70% to 90%, I mean, that's physical things I no longer need to buy in my data center. 
So this matters a lot. And it gets actually, uh, we think, more challenging in, in a network virtualization or overlay networking environment because by definition, when I start introducing tunnels into the environment, I'm reducing entropy in the overall environment, meaning there are less source destination pairs for things to hash to because it's all going into a tunnel. So many of the traditional sort of ECMP-based hash bucket approaches we've used to try and uh, load balance and spray traffic across a large number of links become less effective, not more effective in an overlay environment. Um, so we need technologies like layer one multipathing uh, and uh, frame-based trunking spraying in order to compensate for that, that I can't rely on the entropy and the IP header in order to be the thing that allows me to balance. Um, from a control perspective, um, this is, I, I suspect we may have hit on this earlier, but I want to make sure this is clear. Um, Part of what we think a fabric should do is enable natively within it these constructs of service level APIs. So if what the orchestration layer wants to send down is I have two new VMs and I want to create a new network between them, that really should be about three API calls. Create network, add MAC address to network, add MAC address to the network. That's what that should be. In a traditional approach, even when I've gone sort of full RESTful programmatic control, I don't have this notion of a service level that I can work on a network. I've got to go entity by entity, and I need to know which entity by which entity I go into. So to solve that same use case, I would go into the first hopper rack switch. I would say, I want you to create a VLAN. I want you to enable spanning tree on that network. I want you to add this particular port onto that VLAN. I want you to add this particular port into that VLAN. OK, now I'm going to go up to the spine. I'm going to do all those again. Now if I've got a second spine node I need to go to, I've got to do those. And then I've got to go down to the other top of rack with the other thing, and I've got to do all of that in there. It is not scalable. It's not recognizing native intelligence that the network has about what that path should be in order to evolve this. Now, if we're talking about building this kind of infrastructure with a handful of switches, you know, who cares? But of course, we're not talking about building this kind of infrastructure with a handful of switches. We're talking about building this infrastructure with thousands or even tens of thousands of switches. Um, one of the, the big web 2.0s who's spoken at ONS a number of times um, was telling us that their unit of measure of a data center at this stage, um, they think they can get it up to about 25,000 physical posts. Um, they've got data centers that are 200,000 physical hosts, but they're driving their notion of a pod up to about 25,000 physical entities. And we said to them, why 25,000? Why not 15? Why not 35? What about 25,000 uh, makes that number work? And roughly paraphrasing, they said, that's about the number that we think we can handle before the wheels start falling off, right? Meaning they're trying to get that scale number up as far as they can before they start feeling like instabilities in the system are going to cause it to, to fall apart on them. Scale matters. And so scaling the control plane matters a lot. Now, not many of us are going to be building 25,000 server data centers today. But everything's getting bigger, more consolidation happening, the server infrastructure is getting bigger, scale matters. Uh, finally, the third piece of this, um, and this is, is, I think is something we would all agree with, is there are tasks that used to require a human being to be done and done well 20 years ago. And now we can all automate them, right? Well understood problems around how I add a device into a network, what's the set of commands that are needed to happen. But that uh, automation has not historically been natively a part of how networking works. It's part of what we think Fabric should do is build that automation natively into it, not for complex topology uh, creation or, or, or any of those sort of policy-centric things. That still requires a human being and a CMS. But the basics of forming a Fabric, uh, injecting um, traffic, building trunks, all of that should be automated at this point. It, it, it does not require human beings to do that. So these three things for us come together into what the attributes of that bottom layer should have as we start building out an SDN. Then we go up a layer and say, let's talk about network virtualization. And there's a ton of conversation these days about uh, data center network virtualization, and I'll touch that in a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about WAN network virtualization. Uh, many of you know that the MLX uh, has supported OpenFlow for a little while now. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to be selected by Internet2 as their technology provider for their 100 gig OpenFlow based backbone. Uh, and this comes back to some of what Kurt was saying earlier. And he said, oh, he is in the back. I was going to say, I lost you there. Um, where Kurt was going earlier in this question about uh, how to make hybrid, a hybrid environment work. 
Uh, hybrid's everything. Hybrid is absolutely everything. There are so few people in the world who have a Google-style network where you've got the human beings, the money, uh, and the technology savvy to go whole hog into OpenFlow. Hybrid will be what everybody deploys for the next probably 20 years. <laughs> Undoubted, right? Because the reality is, for certain use cases, many of them very broadly deployed, traditional forwarding works. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. OSPF works. BGP works. Everybody knows how to make them work. Finding human beings to operate that network is not very expensive, relatively speaking, anymore. Finding a human being to operate an OpenFlow network, very expensive. So we need mechanisms where you can have these sort of more modest use cases that are OpenFlow enabled on top of the existing infrastructure where you're going to use traditional forwarding for everything else. And Internet 2, this is exactly what their use case is. They want a 100 gig uh, WAN for their uh, member universities, member institutions. Um, they want, um, uh, what did the guy call it, a, an embarrassment of wealth of bandwidth. Uh, was his, his way of looking at this. Uh, and so 100 gig. And even if you have an embarrassment of wealth of bandwidth, 100 gig is still nowhere near as cheap as buying you know, a DSL circuit. So uh, you need ways of doubling everybody up on top of that expensive WAN infrastructure. So for them, they have many uh, institutions and customers who just need forwarding, traditional forwarding. They pay a good monthly bill. Internet 2 takes the traffic, it just works, right? There's nothing fancy needed. There's no need to bring OpenFlow into that conversation. But for some of their people, and particularly their data intensive science types, um, this is folks uh, like the human genome type guys or the higher energy physics guys, they are breaking networking, right? They are trying to pass sufficiently large quantities of data that we never designed networking to solve. Um, uh, I asked him who he thought his competition was, and it wasn't AT&T or Verizon, it's FedEx. I said, why is it FedEx? He says, it's because they overnight the tapes. Right? That, mm -hmm. it's, I, I won't use the network. I will go elsewhere and substitute. They so if I'm trying to, to if I'm trying to path, pass exorbitantly large amounts of data over the network, frankly, TCP is really not a very good protocol for that. I need to invent new protocols up in this environment to enable those kind of guys to take better advantage of the network. That's pretty cool. Like networking doesn't really allow you to do that. That's a credible for me use case for OpenFlow. But the problem becomes how do I share this 100 gig link? And so hybrid mode's the answer to that. And what we have an answer for today, in my mind, is the answer of coexistence. You asked a question where I thought you were going earlier was around uh, redistribution. We don't have a really good answer for that yet. That's an yeah, interesting that, question. That was, that was a, that yeah, that is an interesting question. But the way I think about this problem statement is what I really want to start with is two forwarding tables. I want an open flow forwarding table, and I want a traditional FIB that's been created by whatever uh, IGP uh, or EGP I'm running in my environment. And so the hybrid question really is, what's the policy for the interaction of those two forwarding tables? I don't necessarily, for the initial sets of use cases, need to redistribute between them, because I don't need to share. I don't need to use one as a mechanism for transporting uh, information over the other. I just need policy that describes their coexistence. So the protection layer, the hybrid mode with protection that we talk about is a policy construct that says for class, certain classes, excuse me, of traffic, use table number one. For other classes of traffic, use table number two. So for VLANs zero or one through 1,000, they use traditional forwarding. For VLANs 1,000 and one through 4,000, guys go nuts. And of course, as you guys know, the thing that, the tricky piece of that, that sounds fairly straightforward, is with OpenFlow, I can rewrite anything I want. I can rewrite VLAN headers, I can rewrite, rewrite MAC addresses and IP addresses. So creating this policy layer is, is actually reasonably tricky given the power that exists up here, because you can do anything up here. And to ensure that this doesn't leak into the other environment, a little bit tricky. When we talk to the carriers, the carriers have a different point of view. The carriers are less interested in the separation because they think about this hierarchically. I want traditional forwarding for most of my customer traffic, and then I want to use OpenFlow to overrule that forwarding because I have knowledge that the network does not that's going to cause me to make a different policy decision in how I forward things. So uh, CDN said to us, look, my network works. I'm able to get Netflix out to people watching it on their home machines until I get congestion. Congestion for a CDN 
is a service outage event. That's real bad. They said, I would like to trade off congestion for latency. I know what the network looks like. I want to use a suboptimal path to route around the congestion. And yes, that's going to increase latency. And yes, that's going to affect my subscriber experience. But in return, people still get to watch their movies. And that's a good uh, trade-off that I'm willing to make. And so there's an example of where I want to use an open flow-based forwarding table to overrule what the traditional network is going to tell me is the right answer, because I, in fact, know more. Um, and when I get to two slides forward, you'll see that where we think the micro use cases, a lot of them are, the simple way of answering that for OpenFlow is where have I historically had to use PBR? If I've had to use PBR, OpenFlow is a better general purpose answer to almost any PBR problem that exists. All right, last thing before I get there. Um, as I know a number of you had asked us to talk a little bit about this, I mean, it is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, we announced at VMworld uh, support for VXLAN tunnel termination and gateway services on our ADX platform. ADX is our application delivery uh, switching platform. And we think this thing's got a pretty interesting future. Um, uh, there was one of the big Web 2.0 guys that we were talking about, and I said, so are you going towards software services? And he said, yeah. I am not going to have any other traditional networking services in my environment except load balancers. Load balancers are special. Because load balancers are the only scalable entity physically resident in the network that understands layer 7. It's the thing that I trust. And there are going to be use cases where I need higher layer services in the network that I don't want to try and burden a router with, because a router's not been designed to do this stuff. So what's that general purpose thing? If you kind of step back and ask that question, there's really two obvious choices. One is load balancers, the other one is firewalls. Mm. Except nobody wants it to be a firewall because the security guys don't want anybody else touching their stuff. So a general purpose layer seven services platform is gonna be your load balancing platform. So when we looked at that problem, we said, okay, in this data center network virtualization use case where I wanna be bringing uh, traffic from the big bad internet up into a VXLAN environment, I need a scalable hardware-based platform to do that in order to get the amount of scale I want. And there, the flexibility offered by something that is, at the end of the day, a software-centric solution so I can have effectively arbitrarily large table sizes makes sense. Because I'm not limited based on sort of any kind of arbitrary limit on memory on the number of entities up here that I can, I can put into a state table and stick them up into different tunnels. So it scales really, really well. So that's exactly the use case uh, that this particular Web 2.0 architect guy was telling us he wants with this. The other thing I wanted to hit at on this that I think is um, not well understood about this sort of network virtualization use case is the simplicity aspect of it. So you think about what's ugly about configuring something like a, an ADC or a load balancer. Um, the networking side of those things is, is traditionally been kind of ugly. It works really, really well in the most basic use case where I've direct attached the real servers to the load balancer. That works just fine. I can ensure stateful traffic going in both directions through the device. I don't have to worry about any goofy MAC addressing or bridging stuff. It all works. But none of us build networks that way. All of us have at least one, if not multiple different network layers in between those two entities. And so we end up having to do crazy things like SourceNet. We do things like layer three DSR mode in order to try and overcome this distance. Well, by introducing VXLAN into the environment, I, again, I can create an arbitrary, a layer two adjacency across any two arbitrary points in the environment. That has the net effect of meaning every entity looks like it's directly attached to the load balancer. I don't have to do source now. I don't have to do layer three DSR. I don't have to do any of that stuff. In fact, I can get that same benefit to load balance to some server that's in another data center. Because I'll just build a VXLAN tunnel over to that thing. So there is a simplicity that's gonna come out of this that is, um, I think, going to end up being equally as valuable, if not more so, than the sort of flexibility or scalability use cases that we tend to think about this way. All right, 